God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for these brothers who've come out, Lord. I just ask, God, that you would give us a good time tonight. Uh, we'll have a good time of fellowship and learning, Lord, uh, that you would speak to us through your word and that we would um, be able to talk about uh, what's to come. Uh, I just uh, I thank you so much for uh, the time, and I pray that you would be with us. Um, in Christ's name, amen. All right, so... Uh, we've had two sessions so far on eschatology. We've covered, um, in the first session, essentially the entire book of Revelation, uh, which was uh, for sure a whirlwind tour. Um, and then we went through uh, sort of the main millennial views, um, the sort of three primary views, which are represented up here, of premillennial, uh, amillennial, and, and postmillennial um, uh, thinking around the position of Christ's second coming and, and the millennium. Uh, we have gone through um, some very specific views around, um, uh, you know, in, in concert with these sort of three overarching views, we've gone into some uh, specific views, post-millennial preterism, post-millennial hyper-preterism, um, and then we started to go through uh, the dispensational premillennialism uh, that one, first we went through dispensationalism, which I'll probably review again tonight, um, just very briefly. Um, and we sort of ended at mid-tribulation uh, mid um, uh, premillennialism. So the idea is that there's the, uh, the millennium and the positioning of Christ's coming in uh, relation to that millennium. And then there's the rapture and the positioning of the rapture uh, within uh, your particular view. So the first view that we went through was uh, postmillennial preterism, just by way of review. Um, this is a postmillennial view that is very optimistic. Um, it views that the tribulation has already happened. It actually happened a very long time ago, uh, culminating in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD uh, by Rome. Um, it, hurt, it holds that Satan is currently bound in that he can't prevent the gospel from going forward. Um, it believes uh, that the millennium is either happening now or will happen very soon. Um, and it is not necessarily a literal thousand years, although some preterists may believe that it is, and it's just when that thousand years starts. Um, again, it's a very optimistic view, and we talked uh, at length about how um, uh, because of their view, which is that the, the uh, uh, second coming of Christ is not going to occur until the world is one for Christ, they're very evangelistic uh, in their belief. So, so that um, is something that, regardless of your eschatological view, you should probably um, be, which is very evangelistic, uh, looking to, to win the world for Christ. Pastor Jeff talks all about this um, all the time when he talks about um, uh, the means for salvation, although, um, you know, uh, when you think about Calvinism, and he just talked about this um, yesterday in yesterday's sermon, uh, when you think about Calvinism and the sovereignty of God, um, <coughs> God still ordains the means for salvation, um, which he uses us uh, to, to accomplish. Um, so preterists look at the, the world very optimistically. They believe that everything up into Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 has already happened, and that the only things that are in the future are things after, uh, you know, starting at Revelation 20 and verse 7. Um, so just... Uh, again, by way of review, Revelation 26 is, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign uh, with him for a thousand years. And then verse 7 is, And when the thousand years are ended, <laughs> um, Satan will be released from his prison. So um, this, is, this is their view, um, and we talked about uh, the justification for this view, uh, being that Revelation is um, sort of apocalyptic uh, language, which we talked about as being, um, you know, um, poetic hyperbole. Um, and, uh, you know, an example of this was Psalm 6-6, where it talks about um, David saying, you know, I'm weary with my moaning, and every night I flood my bed with tears, right? So he wasn't literally saying that he floods his bed with tears. Um, 
that's an example of sort of uh, um, poetic hyperbole and, and is how preterists <coughs> view a lot of, of Revelation. They, uh, so when you see something in like Revelation 6, 14, where it says the sky vanished like a scroll and is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Well, clearly that's not a literal thing that has happened, but they view that as having already happened, so they view that as sort of um, poetic hyperbole. Um, so that's, that's kind of how the preterists justify it. We talked about how they'll utilize uh, quotes from Josephus, um, you know, talking ab about different things that happened uh, when, when the Romans were attacking Israel up to the destruction of the temple, uh, and they'll use that to kind of draw parallels to some of the uh, language in, um, in uh, Revelation. So we talked about um, when Josephus was talking about the Roman workmen who were leveling the roads for the soldiers so that they could walk through, that that's something that they take as like removing the mountains, right? They were, they were essentially removing the protections from Israel. Uh, preterists also have a very um, small <coughs> view of Revelation in, insofar that when it talks about the world, they believe that it is talking really only about Israel, um, that it's not actually talking about the whole world. Um, and so uh, they'll, they'll look at uh, <coughs> through that lens um, and, uh, and, and kind of um, uh, take it from there. So um, there were other examples that I gave. Again, uh, this is all on the video. This uh, was, was last, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago, but, um, but the last session. Um, we talked about um, some of the examples that they had there. Um, they also believe that Nero Caesar was the first beast or the Antichrist. Um, and one of the sort of neat things that I don't necessarily think is all that relevant, but one of the things that they take is that in the Hebrew language, if you remember, they use Hebrew letters to represent numbers. Um, and when you take the, um, the Hebrew name uh, Nero Caesar, which is Neron Caesar, that those numbers equal 666. So <laughs> that's one of the, one of the things. Um, and that, you know, there was uh, the beast, it, it talks about in Revelation, is persecuting uh, for 42 months, and Nero did persecute um, for about 42 months, uh, dipping Christians in tar and setting them on fire and all kinds of terrible things. Um, the problem um, comes in when you talk about the second beast, creating a statue for the first beast, forcing the world to worship it, and the, stat uh, the statue talking and, um, you know, uh, leading and, and causing the world to worship it. Um, it's kind of harder to justify those types of things. Um, so we went through some slides uh, around preterism um, and some of the, like I said, with these views, I try to steel man most of them, except for the one that's heretical. I try to steel man most of these rather than straw man them. Um, so some of the big things with preterism um, are, you know, all of the discourse where it talks about all these things happening soon. Um, you know, this generation will not pass away. Th that type of language, which um, is a... Um, is, is sort of uh, something that lends credibility to this view. The one thing that it also does require is a very early dating of Revelation. So um, if the destruction of the temple was in 70 AD, the dating of the writing of Revelation would have to be somewhere around 65 AD um, during, you know, the, uh, the part of the problem with this is this was also during uh, Nero's um, uh, you know, rain and, and, and would be like right in the middle of that. Also, most uh, early uh, Christians held the date to be somewhere in the 90s AD rather than in the 60s AD. So it requires um, a pretty early dating um, of, of Revelation. And I did talk about how that preterists, they're very prominent preterists, they're very respected theologians such as R.C. Sproul, Doug Wilson, James White, Jeff Durbin, these are um, people who um, I personally listen to and and um, and, uh, and respect, they're they're strong Reformed theologians who hold the preterist view. Then we talked about hyperpreterism, which is the only heretical view that um, that uh, we covered. As I said in the early parts of this uh, session, you know these views, uh, my views, I hold fairly loosely. I'm um, Happy to be convinced that my view is incorrect, um, but uh, well, I don't, I don't know if I'd be happy that it was because I generally 
I don't want to go through the tribulation, but regardless, um, I, it, I'm, I'm open to my view. Let's put it that way. I'm open to my view being uh, proven wrong. However, um, you know, uh, so in general, we don't look at uh, these esch eschatological views as something to divide over, um, and we should be you know, gracious to, to one another, but they are important and we should debate them. Um, but hyperpreterism is the one exception in, of the views that I'm, that, that I'm uh, covering here that is actually heretical because hyperpreterism uh, views all of Revelation as having already occurred. Um, and, and like we said, uh, it views, um, it, views um, it, it contradicts the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Um, it, it views uh, uh, that everything in the Bible has already been fulfilled, the second coming has already happened, we're now living in the eternal kingdom, there is no literal resurrection, there's no eternal life. Uh, we're in the new heavens and the new earth. Congratulations, everyone. Um, and it denies, you know, central tenets of Christianity. So this this one is the one uh, heretical view uh, that that we should actually divide over because this this one can't be true. Um, so that brings me back to um, the premillennial dispensational view. Uh, so again, premillennial meaning that. Um, the millennium hasn't happened yet, or isn't in the process of, of, of happening. Um, and uh, it's dispensational in that it holds to dispensationalism rather than uh, covenant theology. Um, covenant theology teaches things like uh, replacement theory, it's, it, that the church replaces Israel, and so when the New Testament is talking about Israel, it's actually talking about the church. Um, it holds that there's a, uh, a covenant of works and then a covenant of grace. I don't really have a problem with that so much, but um, but the the replacement of uh, Israel with the church brings lots of curious questions to mind around 144,000 that we talked about when we were going through Revelation. We talked about 12,000 um, uh, Jews from you know 12 uh, 12,000 from each tribe, um, and so when you argue with somebody who holds to covenant theology and this whole, whole replacement theory, you, you have to say. Um, okay, which tribe am I? If I'm one of the 144,000, which tribe am I from? Since I'm not ethnically Jewish, um, I don't I don't know how to answer that question. But dispensationalism offers uh, seven dispensations that the Bible is essentially divided into the seven dispensations. One being innocence uh, for Eden, post Eden, which is conscience, post flood, which is civil government, uh, the promise, which is Abraham, Moses, and the law, uh, the church age, which we're in currently, which is uh, uh, you know. Jesus, and then the millennium, which is the theocracy that's to come. Um, so premillennialism, premillennialism holds that Jesus will return in the future, reign for a little, literal thousand years. Um, the first resurrection of the saved is at the beginning of that millennium, followed by the thousand year reign. And then at the end of the millennium, Satan is released, deceives those who he can, and has a, a final uh, uh, has a, has a final rebellion and uh, then the judgment um, and the second resurrection happens. Um, and so that's kind of very briefly the, uh, the order of things. And um, regardless of your view of the rapture, that still holds true. The question of the rapture starts to come in um, when you start looking at um, pre-tribulation, pre-wrath, uh, or mid-tribulation, pre-wrath, uh, and post-tribulation um, views of when the church will actually be raptured um, prior to the, the millennium. Um, so we went through uh, pre-tribulation um, arguments, which uh, again tried to steel man the argument here. Um, so the, the pre-tribulation arguments um, uh, the, the, the first and, and foremost was the First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 passage, which talks about how um, we're not destined for wrath, right? So it, it talks, um, it, it says, Now concerning these, uh, the times and seasons, brothers, you have, no, uh, you, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. 
for you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. Uh, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. And that's the important one, verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So that's really, um, we talked about and when we went through Revelation. Does anyone remember the sort of three big slides that I went through? what those three events were. There were seven what's followed seals. by seals. Right, so there was the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, right? The seals um, was, we talked about the scroll of the Lamb. And John was, as he's you know, in heaven, he's uh, in his vision, he's in heaven and he's crying because no one is worthy to open the scroll. Um, and then uh, they said, stop crying because... Jesus was, was there and was worthy to, to open the scroll. And we talked about how scrolls in those days were sealed seven times, right? Um, so, you know, uh, land deeds, wills, etc. cetera. Um, and so as uh, the seals are being uh, opened, different events are happening, right? Um, and, you know, so when you talk about uh, the wrath, the trumpets are generally looked at as wrath. The bowls are generally looked at as wrath, but the wrath doesn't really begin until um, really after the sixth seal, right? And so um, when it says we're not destined for wrath, that, that says, okay, well, at least up to that point, we're pretty safe saying that if, if, if we're not destined for wrath, then we're not destined for any of those trumpets or bowls, right? Um, and, when, uh, and the seventh seal as well. Um, so... Um, all that does is save us, though, from, from that, right? So uh, from a pre-tribulation view that says, okay, well, that saves us from part of the tribulation, but not all of the tribulation. Um, but the pre-tribulation uh, argument, you know, over and above that, um, also talks about uh, in Revelation 3.10 when it says the church will be spared from the hour of trial. This is Jesus. It says, because, this is Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my word about, uh, about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world um, to try those who dwell on earth. Um, anum, another is that the seven-year tribulation sp is specifically a time for God to uh, work with the Jews and not necessarily the church. Um, God's messenger, Angel Gabriel, speaks of this in Daniel 9. Uh, the tribulation is referring to... Uh, uh, as Daniel's 70th week. Um, and so in Daniel 9.24, it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Uh, Paul also speaks about it in Romans, um, where the final gen when, you know, once the final Gentile is saved, the church is raptured, Blinders removed from the eyes of the Jewish people. Um, so, th you know, this talks about, um, because the church actually isn't mentioned um, after, I think it's Revelation 4, um, the church really isn't mentioned much uh, after that. Um, it's really all about, um, you know, God working with the Jewish people. Um, and then another argument is Luke 21, uh, 36. Um, where uh, Jesus said, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place in the stand before the Son of Man. Um, so it's talking about, you know, uh, escaping. So pre-tribulationists will use these um, passages to argue for um, the, the rapture of the church before um, the tribulation. Tribulation is actually structured in um, into two three and a half year segments so the full tribulation is seven years um, the the tribulation is is broken into the the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years um, and if you actually I'm probably going to bring up a timeline uh, when we talk about pre-wrath here in a minute that talks a bit about it as well but um, there's uh, there's 
you know, the, the pre-tribulation um, stance, which is that prior to the tribulation, God will rapture his church, then the tribulation will occur, which is inclusive of the, all seven seals, um, the trumpets and the bowls. Um, there's mid-tribulationists who think it's right at the midpoint, right, which is um, sort of when the Antichrist is revealed. Uh, there's post-tribulationists, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, that think it happens, you know, at the end. And then there's also a view that is sort of just after mid-tribulationists <coughs> that is a pre-wrath, which says that Christians will go through all of the tribulation up to the point of wrath, of God's wrath being unleashed on the world, and then will be raptured. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the gist of where that goes. Um, Pre-tribulationists use these, these verses as arguments. Mid-tribulation, um, mid-tribulationists, and this is kind of where we laugh, left off last time, mid-tribulationists um, believe that it happens right at the middle, right, which is essentially at the fifth seal, uh, the opening of the fifth seal. Um, and they'll generally point to the chron chronology given in Thessalonians sec uh, 2, 1 through, yeah, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, um, which talks about uh, the man of lawlessness. So now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quick, quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to that effect. You guys can probably remember this from uh, Pastor's sermon where he talked about how there must have been people who were writing letters impersonating uh, the apostles. Um, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Um, so, Cornerstone. What are the three things that have to happen Pastor Jeff does this all the time from the pulpit. <laughs> what are the three things? Apostasy. 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 Revelation of the abomination of desolation, or revelation of the antichrist, um, and and then the day of, the day of Christ. So mid tribulation uh, views um, mid mid tribulational views uh, teach that the antichrist will not be decisively revealed until the abomination that causes desolation. Right, which occurs right at the, that midpoint. Um, and so in Matthew 24, 15, it says, uh, so this is Jesus, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And in Daniel 9, 27, which is the reference that Jesus was talking about, it says, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of, of abominations shall come the one who makes desolate until the decree, uh, decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So Pastor Jeff talks about this all the time. He sort of prepped us, uh, I guess, for this, uh, for this stuff. Um, Matt, so, quick question. Yeah, yeah, go for so it. So on the, uh, the lineup on the top, so there's three yeah. uh, bubbles on top. Yeah, it's hard to see, um, but yeah, you've got... Uh, you've really only got the three views here, which is the, the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib um, views right up there where it's got this, this box that talks about the tribulation. Right. Uh, and it talks about the churches being raptured either in the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. This particular view, I got uh, the references for where I got all these pictures is in the, <laughs> the um, Word document that since today will be our last session on eschatology, I'll send out to everybody. Um, so you'll have references to where I got a lot of these images um, there are tons of images on online, but this one doesn't cover pre-wrath, um, it, so it's it's one that we'll we'll add to uh, as well. But the pre-wrath you would see basically as a dot just next to that middle dot, right? It would literally be just right next to it, um, mm -hmm. but between the post-trib and the, the mid-trib. And then um, the, the one that drops down below the blue yes. one. Blue one. Blue one says Christ returns. Oh, okay. So Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, right? Which okay. Revelation pretty clearly clearly spells out right before the you know he establishes his millennial kingdom, New Heavens, New Earth, New Jerusalem, all of that, right? Um, and then after the millennium, you've got the final rebellion, um, and then the final judgment, where you end up with believers and unbelievers <coughs> going to their respective places. <laughs> um, versus a post-millennial view. 
which would say that you know all this stuff has happened already, where you know the the sort of tribulation happened back before 70 A.D. Um, we're now in essentially this this church a church age where society progressively improves. Again, their optimistic, very optimistic view. Um, after which the world is one for Christ, and Christ comes back uh, a second time for the final judgment. Now, in a post-millennial uh, view, the church, you know, at some point is going to be raptured, only to come right back down immediately to, to you know, do, to, to have the judgment, right? So, um, <coughs> and then we're going to talk, amillennialism is the last one we're going to talk about, so we'll get to that bottom one here in a minute. But the mid-tribulationists would use Daniel 7.25, which says the Antichrist will have power over the saints uh, for three and a half years to bolster their point of, of basically being raptured, being around for the tribulation to be raptured. Um, so Daniel 7.25 says, He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. Daniel's super confusing too, so um, <laughs> I'm sure my father-in-law could probably step you through it. <laughs> like I said, he spent a he spent a I think a year doing this. So, um, so they assume that this is the first half of the tribulation, and that the saints spoken of are the church. So it's a couple of assumptions that are made. They also interpret the day of Christ as the rapture. Um, so the church uh, will not be caught up into heaven until after the Antichrist is revealed. Um, one of the other things that mid-tribulationists uh, talk about is that uh, foundational um, to mid-tribulationism is that the trumpet uh, in 1 Corinthians 15.52 is the same trumpet mentioned in Revelations 11.15. Um, the, the trumpet in Revelations 11 is the final in a series of trumpets, um, and it's you know, essentially the last trumpet. Um, and so the, the, the trumpet of uh, 1 Corinthians, so it's the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians uh, 15. But the problem with this is that uh, the trumpet in Corinthians is a call of God, whereas the ones in Revelations are a judgment. Right? They're, it's not calling people home. It's, it's, it's essentially causing judgment on, you know, uh, on the earth. Um, so the, the trumpet that's the call um, of grace to God's elect, um, whereas the other one's a pronouncement of doom on the wicked, right? So they, they have different purposes, so it's hard to complete them. Um, so uh, that leads us into, so we've done pre-tribulation, we've done mid-tribulation, now we've got pre-wrath. Um, so the pre-wrath view is similar to mid-tribulation, um, but with a difference. Uh, so the timing of the rapture is super, super close to mid-tribulationists, um, but mid-tribulationists holds it's right at the middle of that three and a half years, which is um, essentially at the fifth seal. Um, but pre-rathers will view um, really the rapture having, uh, you know, having to do with when the beginning of the day of the Lord is, um, which uh, they would argue is just after the sixth seal. Um, and so uh, the pre-wrath rapture uh, theory views the trumpet and bowl judgments as the wrath of God, which they clearly are, um, and that the church is exempted of that. Uh, we just talked about that with 1 Thessalonians 5.9. Um, but the first six uh, seal judgments um, are not considered the wrath of God. They're, they're, they're viewed as the wrath of Satan or the wrath of the Antichrist. Um, the, the wrath of, of God is really viewed at that seventh seal and beyond, right? Because the seventh seal, if you remember, was silence in heaven because of the, the horror that was happening. Um, uh, and then you've got the seven uh, trumpets, which, if you remember, was like a third of the sea, a third of the uh, fresh water, uh, you know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, like were a third darkened. It was like thirds, right? A lot of sort of... Um, uh, judgments uh, for that, and then you finally have the bowls, which is everything in the sea dies, and everything in the freshwater dies, and the sun is is blackened, and the moon uh, is blackened, and the stars fall out of the sky, and it's like um, just like way worse than it was with the trumpets even. Um, but the first six seals was like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, with the first four right, 
Um, and uh, but the wrath of God doesn't actually happen until uh, you get to that um, uh, that seventh seal. Um, and there's no direct mention of God's wrath until the sixth seal is broken in Revelation 6.17. So according to the pre-wrath rapture theory, the church will be uh, present to experience those first six, but nothing beyond that. So the rapture must occur at that time. Uh, so if you compare Revelation 6 with Matthew 24, the pre-wrath rapture theorists identify the first sealed, uh, first sealed judgments with this <coughs> description of the end times in Matthew 24, 4 through 14. Um, do you want to you want to read that for me? Matthew twenty four. Matthew twenty four four through fourteen. Getting close. Twenty four four through fourteen. Yep, ten verses. And Jesus answered, "See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. <clears throat> and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars." See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to the tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise, and there will be many <coughs> astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures till the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So in the pre-wrath uh, rapture view, they view this whole uh, passage as Jesus describing what Christians will go through in those first six seals um, prior to the wrath of, of God uh, being unleashed um, on the earth because again you go back to that first Thessalonians where it says we're not destined for wrath so so the view here is that you you know we, we suffer uh, some persecution um, some of the tribulation but uh, we are spared from the wrath of God which will be you know horrendous um, so Jesus refers to these events these events as the beginning of birth pain uh, pains in verse 8 uh, in verse 29 and 30 uh, the sign uh, of the Son of Man appears in the sky, and it's at this time, according to the pre-wrath rapture theory, that the rapture occurs. Um, so that's essentially uh, a, a nutshell uh, version of pre-wrath. I have a cool, like, um, I have a cool uh, uh, timeline that if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll probably go through real quick. That actually is, it's like an animated thing where you can scroll through it and actually. It's, it's, I think it's prewrathrapture.com or something, um, where it goes through this like cool little um, thing where you can uh, cycle through and it talks about the timeline um, and sort of categorizes that timeline in like the beginning of birth pains, um, you know, the, the wrath of, of Satan or the Antichrist, um, followed by uh, the rapture and the, and the wrath of God. Let me just bring something up. Maybe the thought with which you just discussed is the seals, the, the scroll of the Lamb. Yeah. is not literally opened until the seventh seal is opened because they sequentially open the seal. Maybe that's what their thought is, that when you get to the seventh seal, now it's the scroll of the Lamb. Well, yeah, when you look through the, the seals, right, I just brought the seals uh, slide up, you've got the first four seals, which are the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So you've got the white horse, which is conquest, although it was a peaceful conquest, right? Uh, then you have the, uh, the red horse, which is war, uh, then the war is followed by famine, which is the black horse, and then finally death, which is the pale horse. The fifth seal is the souls of the martyrs calling out for justice, and then the sixth seal is essentially the earthquake and the sun turns black. And so, um, you know, the, uh, b before there was a pause, and then finally the seventh seal, which is silence in heaven, right? Um, and so the, the view here would be that um, you know, if a mid-tribulationist, they would say, you know, basically at the, at the souls of the martyrs, right, at that fifth seal, that's when the rapture happens. Pretty <coughs> rapid, it's like, okay, just a little right bit after that. Yeah, a little, little bit after more. that, right, yeah. um, is where you would get that. Whereas you got the trumpets, which are clearly yeah. judgments, right? you got hail and fire, fiery mounds, blazing star, darkness. You've got tormenting locusts. You've got mounted warriors, and um, right, again, giving uh, Paul a pause. Then you've got the two witnesses, and then... Um, you know, God reigns in heaven. Uh, and then you've got the bulls of wrath, which are like, 
way worse than the trumpets even, right? You've got the, um, the land, the, the bowl poured out on the sea, which kills literally everything in the sea, um, all the rivers and springs uh, in the third bowl and so forth and so on, right? And you've got <laughs> darkness, it's poured on, um, on the, the throne of the beast, right? So all that worship the beast are stricken. Um, and they're stricken so, so much that they wish for death and can't find it, right? Like, they're an enemy <coughs> and they wish for death and can't find it. Um, and then, you know, seventh bowl, end, end game, right? Um, so, yeah, so then, we, uh, so then we, we get to, so that's in a nutshell. Now, there's each one of these views we could literally spend weeks and weeks and months and months studying each one of these views. Um, don't smile back there. Um, my father-in-law actually did, did, a, did a study, and I think it, it lasted, what, a year? Was it a year? Um, and he gave me a lot of his materials for, and it was just on the pre-wrath view. Um, and there's like probably two pages just of scripture verses with uh, talking about that. So when I said at the outset this is a one-on-one class, it's definitely a one-on-one class, right? We're just going through the, the very, um, the very, um, you know, sort of top of, uh, topic uh, or topical um, view of this, right? It's very top level. Um, but that's effectively the pre-wrath view. Um, one of the arguments that pre-wrathers will make, though, um, versus uh, over the pre-tribulation view, is that um, we shouldn't, uh, one of the, the debates, right, they, they, you should consider a pre-rather and a pre-tribber as uh, brothers, right? They're, they're, um, uh, <coughs> it's, it's not um, apostasy to, 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 uh, or, or heresy to believe that. Um, but uh, one of the arguments that pre-rathers will make is that pre the pre-tribulation view sets Christians up to believe that they're spared from any and all tribulation. Um, rather than uh, having to endure some tribulation only be, to be spared from God's wrath. Um, and I think that's a reasonable argument to make. Um, because if uh, you could see how it would shake someone's faith to believe that you're going to be spared from tribulation only to have to go through it if the pre-tribulation view is incorrect. Um, versus if the pre-wrath view is incorrect and the pre-trib uh, view is correct, the pre-rather get spared from it anyway. <laughs> their, their, their faith isn't shaken. So it's a, it's a good, um, you know, it's, it's another way of thinking about the view. Um, I'm on the fence between the pre-trib and pre-wrath. Um, I really like the, the preterist view because of its optimistic, um, you know, evangelistic view, but, um, but I can't get behind reading Revelation in the way that preterists read Revelation. It makes a lot more sense uh, from a premillennial perspective to think of all of this apocalyptic things happening in the future. Also, it's, I think, a more literal reading of Revelation um, than it is, um, uh, you know, for preterism where you're having to sort of stretch, um, stretch the apocalyptic uh, interpretation to, to kind of its breaking point. Are those specific like, denominations, like you mentioned, R.C. Sproul and a couple of other names, like, are, do they fall into certain denominations? They do. That way, or they do. So uh, Presbyterians um, are generally amillennial or preterist. Um, you know, whereas if you look at some of the other, like Baptists, or, uh, you'll see a lot of them are pre-millennial, most of them pre-tribulation, but pre-tribulation is just the most popular view, pre-millennial view, so it, it tends to be... But even in this church, we have people who are pre-tribulation, pre-millennialists, and people who are pre-wrath, pre-millennialists. Um, I don't know of any preterists in our church, but um, there are, you know, like R.C. Sproul was a preterist, uh, even though a lot of Presbyterians are on, on, on millennialists. All right, so post-tribulation, uh, this is still a pre-millennial view, but post-tribulation means the church is going to go through the entire tribulation, including all of the, the judgments. Um, so it, it teaches that the rapture occurs at the end or very near the end of the tribulation. Um, and at that time, the church will meet Christ in the air and then do a U-turn and come right back down for the judgment, right? Because the second coming happens at the end of the tribulation, just before the establishment of the millennial kingdom. Um, and Christ comes and, uh, and does the initial judgment before the final judgment at the end of the millennium. Um, so the church would then be raptured at the end of the tribulation and then, like, say hi to Jesus in the air and spin around and come right back down um, for that first judgment because it talks about when Jesus comes in the second coming that there's all of the, the people on the white horses, you know, all the saints coming with him um, 
in that second coming. So, um, uh, so when he comes down, uh, so, so this would be that the rapture and the second coming would be simultaneous. It would happen exactly at the same time. Um, so according to this, church, uh, to this view, the church goes through the entire seven-year tribulation. Uh, Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, and many Protestant denominations espouse a post-tribulation view of the rapture, <coughs> which is something I learned going through this study. I didn't realize that Roman Catholics and, uh, and Greek Orthodox um, were, were both um, post-tribulation. This yes. is probably a... What do you call those kind of questions that don't require an answer? Um, but rhetorical. Yeah. How how do they deal with the fact that we are not destined to wrath? It's a good question. Wrath comes. It's a good question. Yeah, that First Thessalonians uh, passage is is you know it's pretty stark. Um, I don't know how they get past that, but I know that they hold to these views. Probably. Again, we could dive. Well, Catholics don't read the Bible. I don't think. For real. A lot, a lot of them don't. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, but if, if, say, you were to ask a Catholic priest, who does read the Bible, right? If you're asking a, a Catholic priest, uh, I don't know what their answer would be. It's a good question, though. I, I think eternal wrath is typically... Is that what it is? That. Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, see, I, I, I've, I've, I've grown up not being Catholic. Um, it, uh, I wish my mother-in-law was here. Um, <laughs> she, she grew up Catholic. <laughs> she grew up Catholic, and she probably knows the answer to that question. Nah. <laughs> you speaking of your mother-in-law, which is my wife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when she got saved, she was Catholic all her life, went to yes. Catholic school, blah, blah, blah. When she got saved, she wrote a 19-page letter to the Monsignor at St. Cecilia's in Pennsylvania. He would not even talk to her or answer her. Uh, yep. Just ignored it. She even know. said that, I think she even said she wanted to talk, and they would just shut the door in her face. They, yeah. didn't, they didn't want to have a discussion. They didn't want to debate the Bible. She got saved, having been a Catholic all her life, uh, started reading the Bible and, go, <coughs> and started saying, this stuff doesn't make sense. <laughs> what I've been taught all my life doesn't make sense with what I'm reading. And so she went to talk to the, uh, to the priests and the Monsignors, and they didn't want to have a debate with her, um, which, you know, is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so the one strength of post-tribulationalism is that Jesus, in his extended discourse on the end times, uh, says he will return after the Great Tribulation. Um, again, trying to steal in all the arguments here. Um, so in Matthew 24, 29 through 30, it says, and this is Jesus, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, for the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see, uh, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So, uh, the book of Revelation, um, uh, also the book of Revelation, uh, with all its various prophecies, men only mentions um, one coming of the Lord, and that occurs after the tribulation in Revelation uh, 19 and 20. Um, passages such as Revelation 13, 7, 29, also lend support to post-tribulationism uh, in that there, are, there will obviously be saints in the tribulation, uh, also, the resurrection of the dead in uh, Revelation 25 is called the first resurrection. Uh, Post-tribulationalists um, assert that uh, since the first uh, resurrection takes place after the tribulation, the resurrection associated with the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 cannot occur until then. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet uh, of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Post tribulationists also point out that historically God's people have experienced times of intense persecution and trial therefore they say shouldn't surprise us at all that the church also experienced uh, a great tribulation um, of the end time. <coughs> in relation to this the post tribulationist view also distinguished Satan's wrath or man's wrath from God's wrath in the book of Revelation, Satan's wrath is directed against the saints, and God uh, allows it as a means of purifying his faithful. On the other hand, God's wrath is poured out on the Antichrist in his godless kingdom, and God will protect his people from that punishment. So, that's sort of the, the, um, 
three view, or four views rather of the rapture uh, in a premillennial view. There is a, another view, before we get to amillennialism, there's another view that I actually kind of like. I don't, I'm not going to say that I espouse this view. Mike Winger, uh, who I, I watched one of his uh, things on, on End Times View, the video is, is, in the, is linked in the uh, references of the document that I'll send out if you guys want to watch it. Um, but the, um, he has what's called a premillennial dispen uh, progressive dispensational view. Um, and it's not progressive in the sort of uh, political sense that we use uh, today. It's it's more of um, it's more of uh, just um, the progression of events in uh, in the Bible. So it's very similar to a premillennial dispensational view, but it incorporates preterism, um, and it incorporates the preterist view as foreshadowing, though, not as the actual events of Revelation, but a foreshadowing of the events of Revelation. So just as there was lots of uh, stuff in the Old Testament foreshadowing Christ, it views a lot of what the uh, preterists <coughs> view as actually Revelation being, prophecy being fulfilled, as simply a foreshadowing of those things that are yet to be fulfilled. I've heard that called like a near and a far, like it's a, yeah. when it was written at the time, there yep. was a, a completion of it but then there's also a greater completion of yes exactly and that's exactly what it is so it's still fundamentally a premillennial view it's not a postmillennial preterist view it's still fundamentally a premillennial view but it, but again takes the the preterist views as foreshadowing so um, so the the events so you can hold to uh, both the premillennial but can appreciate the preterist view as being sort of a a foreshadowing of things to come um, so, it's kind of cheating. <laughs> I think it's a little bit cheating um, because you're like, hey, I like the Preterist view, so I'm going to take these aspects as foreshadowing, but um, I'm still going to hold to premillennial, um, pre-tribulation or pre-wrath um, views, right? All right, so, that, so that, that's just one I wanted to mention, uh, and then we get to sort of the last view that we'll cover, um, and that is amillennialism. So, Although we talked about pre- and post-millennialism, and we talked about some sub-views, amillennialism is just kind of amillennialism. Um, I don't know of a lot of sub-views. I'm sure there might be, and we could probably do some research on them, but, but amillennialism is kind of its own thing. Um, so again, this is one of the three big views. It's the one here at the bottom, um, and it, it's uh, probably the most different out of, out of all of them. Um, it's a little bit close to a post-millennial view, um, in that it holds that the millennium is kind of happening now, but it is a um, sort of spiritualized millennium. Um, so it holds that the millennium is happening now, but it's happening in heaven, not on earth. Um, that Jesus is reigning in heaven in his millennial kingdom, and that the saints are reigning with him. Um, it is a spiritual reign, not a physical reign. Um, and the millennium is not a literal thousand years, clearly because it's been 2,000. Um, that Satan is currently bound. Uh, and again, they, they borrow from, I think, the post-millennial uh, post view that the definition of Satan being bound is that Satan cannot prevent the gospel from going forth. Um, and, uh, and so it's, the gospel is going out to all the nations. Um, this is, uh, unlike the sort of preterist views or the post-millennial views, this is a pessimistic view, more like the premillennial views. So premillennialism, world's going to get worse, worse, and worse. Until finally there's a tribulation, whichever your view is on the rapture, the rapture happens, God comes back, right? Jesus comes back. Um, <clears throat> Post-millennialism was, you know, world's going to get better and better and better, world's going to be one for Christ, Christ is going to come back. This amillennial view holds um, that the world is going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. So it's, it's pessimistic like premillennial, uh, even though it borrows from post-millennial uh, with the, the millennial <coughs> uh, being, being now. Um, so the, the tribulation that happens, though, uh, with amillennialism, the tribulation is sort of figurative. Um, it, it, uh, uh, it, the tribulation happens at the end of this figurative millennium, followed by the second uh, coming of Christ. Um, this kind of forces you to have an idealistic or spiritualist view of Revelation. So they're, they're taking this as sort of, again, apocalyptic language, 
n nothing literal. Um, it's uh, they, they view Revelation as not being prophetic necessarily. It's not prof uh, uh, prophesying of things or predicting things that are in the future, but it's more like parables, right? It's it's um, it's uh, the kind of things that'll happen uh, prior to the coming of Christ. So these are the types of things that are going to happen uh, to us before Christ comes back. So our millennialist view of Revelation is that it's just really filled with apocalyptic language um, and, and is figurative. Um, this makes Revelation <coughs> super flexible, though, right? Um, because uh, it can uh, be applicable to all kinds of things, right? Um, uh, there's since it's not really prophetic things. So when you're talking about you know um, everything in the sea dying and stuff, that well, that's just that's figurative language. It's not doesn't mean that actually all living creatures in the sea will die. Um, so it's really just Revelation's a book of symbolism, right, um, and not prophecy. Um, it doesn't really provide any real explanations to why there are specific prophecies, though. So it talks specifically about 144,000 Jews that are going you know, to be 12,000 from each of the, the tribes that are going to come down. They're not going to be able to be harmed. They're going to win an, un, an innumerable multitude of people to Christ, right? Like, there's very specific prophecies that, that are in Revelation, and it doesn't really, amillennialism doesn't really account um, for those being, being as specific as they are. Um, so it, it can lead to eisegesis. It can lead to, to uh, you being able to develop your own theology and read that into the book. That's a big fancy word for reading your worldview into, um, so they talk about exegesis versus eisegesis. Eisegesis is, I take my worldview and I read it into the text. Exegesis is I look at the text and get my worldview out of it, right? Um, and so that, um, you know, since it's very flexible and since it's sort of symbolic, you can kind of twist, you know, bend it around whatever, um, you know, theology you want to bend it. Did you say that's more of Roman Catholicism? Again? No, their their view is post tribulation premillennialism. Uh, amillennial is more the Presbyterian. Uh, a lot of Presbyterians are amillennials. Um, some of them are preterists. Um, Jacob, who's down at RBC, there's a lot of Presbyterians uh, down there, and you know some of them are preterists, some of them are amillennials, and they're trying to convert him. So <laughs> they, they like he's at a Bible college. They like to have lots of debates about the Bible. Go figure. Um, and so yeah, so you'll you'll find that uh, certain denominations hold to, to these views. So Baptists and and uh, even like e, e free, you'll see a lot of uh, premillennialists. Um, you know, you've got other churches uh, that'll, that'll hold uh, post-mill views, some Presbyterians, um, and, and so forth. Um, the, the thing about it is, again, um, this stuff is not set in stone. With the exception of the one um, uh, heretical view, any, you know, any of these views have, have theologians that have argued for them um, well. There's a, a video uh, called A Night of Eschatology that I watched couple of years ago, um, which really got me uh, um, kind of excited about learning about uh, eschatology. Um, it is, it is, um, it, it was years ago that it happened, um, but it was uh, moderated by uh, John Piper, um, but he had three other people, one, one uh, representing premillennialism, one postmillennialism, one amillennialism. I don't remember their names except for Doug Wilson, who was the postmillennialist. Um, uh, in, in there, and I thought it was a fantastic, it's like an hour and a half long, it was a fantastic um, debate of these guys kind of going back and forth with their views and, and arguing for them. It was very you know, conciliatory, it wasn't uh, uh, heated or anything like that, but I thought it was a really good introduction, because I didn't really, um, you know, it's not, you know, this isn't something that I took a lot of time to study back in the day, right? It was just kind of one of those, I don't really know what's going to happen, I like the pre-trib, pre-millennial view because it means I don't have to go through, through the tribulation, so I'm going to stick with that. A lot of people I, I know have that view, so, you know, it's the future. Whatever happens, happens. Are the views, so like historically, like, so if we look back a thousand years, yes. one of them might have made more sense at the time based on what was revealed. What, what you find if you actually look back is that the, the post-millennial view is not one of the early views. Um, the early views of the early church fathers was a pre-millennial view. Um, uh, regardless of, of the, the timing of the rapture, it was a pre-millennial view. They viewed Revelation as being prophecy of things to come. 
So um, it was, uh, you know, preterism. I, I might have actually talked about this uh, when we went through preterism last week. Um, but it, it's something that, uh, or actually, no, it was, it was covenant theology that I was thinking of. Um, that keep, didn't come around until I think it was like the 1800s. So, um, so yeah. So uh, that is amillennialism. Uh, so again, we've done a surface level view uh, of each uh, of the eschatological, the six eschatological views, um, and three main millennial views um, that are primarily held by, um, uh, by Christians. Um, again, I emphasize that this is not something we should primarily divide over. Um, it is uh, something that regardless of which of the five views, with the exception of the one heretical view, um, that you subscribe to, um, you could be right. Um, the, uh, it's not something we should divide over, um, but it is important. It is something we should study. It is something we should debate. debate. Um, the only thing that we know for certain is that the Lord is coming back, and it may be soon. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a comment. It's still on uh, YouTube, A Night of Eschatology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a good watch. Uh, I think I might have had it in my references as well. Um, even though I didn't use it primarily for the study uh, for this, it was one, something that influenced me from, from back, and I just I like to include everything um, for, for all of you to, you know, at your leisure, get, you know, dig into. So I'll have, I have references to, in the Word document that I'll send out to everybody, I have references to all of the articles, uh, all of the um, uh, uh, videos and so forth that I, that I used in preparation for this. Again, uh, the goal of this was to, to do a surface level view, not to do an in-depth view, or unless you guys want to spend months doing eschatological views. We can certainly come back and do that later, but we have a lot of other topics that we we'll want to get to in the apolog apologetic series. Anything else? Yeah, Matt, just one thing. Um, usually, you know, you're familiar with Jake Dwight Pentecost, right? Dwight Pentecost outlines laws for interpretation, specifically eschatology and Bible interpretation. He says the law of first reference, the first reference you come to in the Bible usually sets the pattern for what that event means. And he says the law of first reference regarding the tribulation is from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30, which <coughs> says, when you see these things happen in the last days, come upon Israel in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and hear his voice. So he's saying there, when you come to the tribulation in the last days, it's referring specifically to Israel. Mm. And the purpose of the tribulation was meant for Israel to bring them back to God. And that is one of the pre-tribulation um, arguments that I, that I talked about earlier mm -hmm. when we were doing pre-tribulation. That, that really when you think, the church is mentioned in the very early parts of Revelation, um, but it's not. It, there's a whole section in the middle where it's not mentioned until Christ comes back, and so that's one of the big arguments for for pre-tribulation uh, views is that there's this absence of talking about the church. They're talking about Israel, which again goes back to the difficulty that we have with things like covenant theology, where it talks about the church replacing Israel, right? Which again could lend you to start thinking about you know some of these other views. But the the issue there is that when it says very specific things like you know, 12,000 you know, 12, uh, tw from each tribe each of tribe. Israel, right? Like that, I, I, I argue uh, with, with people and I say, okay, let's say we're all part of the 144,000. I don't know if any of you are from Jewish descent. I, am, I know that I'm not. Which tribe am I a part of, right? Am I, am I part of Judah? Yeah. I don't know. Like, um, I don't know how you, how you reconcile that um, because there are places where it talks about the church, and there are places where it talks about Israel. And so I always go back to, if it says Israel, I think it means Israel. And when it says the church, it means the church. It's not as if it used Israel, and in some contexts it was talking about the church, and in others it was talking about, and it never used the church, or vice versa, right? It uses both, and so I, I, have, to, I have to believe that that was intentional, and that when it's talking about the church, it would say the church, and when it talks about Israel, it would say Israel. Anything else before we wrap up? All right, Phil, do you mind closing this out? 
Lord God, we just thank you, <clears throat> Jesus, that you are coming back, Lord. We thank you. Uh, and we just give you praise and glory. We glorify your name, Lord. And we look forward to your coming. We say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. God, and we just ask uh, that you would be with us as we leave here, be with us in our in our daily lives, Lord God, and, and uh, just draw us closer to you and to your word and into prayer, Lord God, so that we are ready for you when we come back. And Lord, help us to evangelize the lost, Lord, and, and uh, just carry out your call for those who, who you've just predestined from before the beginnings of the foundations of the earth, Lord God, just use us to, in a mighty way to, to draw them into your kingdom, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.